next guest, if I read his whole resume, my speech would probably be longer than his. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what he's done. He has served from 2002 to 2007 as the Under Secretary General and High Representative of the United Nations responsible for the most vulnerable countries of the world. Also as a career diplomat, he served as Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations in New York from 1996 to 2011, 2001. Please help me in welcoming Ambassador Anwar Chowdhury. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for that introduction. And uh, uh, congratulations to, to the UN Students Alliance um, of the University of Tampa, uh, UNA USA Tampa Bay area, uh, who have joined together to hold this event. And I'm delighted to be visiting here uh, this is um, now that uh, after some lapse of memory, it is, I recollect that I'm here for the second time speaking from the same podium in the same room uh, with a gap of 10 years. But um, also, I thank all of you and uh, the two co-chairs, Matt and Shannon. Shannon, happy birthday to you. Uh, many happy returns of the day. So it, it is a special day for her and for all of us who have gathered together for, for this uh, wonderful event, focusing on goal eight of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, I will give a little sort of introduction to my involvement with the Millennium Goals and particularly Goal 8. Uh, when I was representing Bangladesh at the United Nations uh, before joining UN in 2002, um, one of the main concern of the developing countries uh, was that out of the eight goals, seven goals impose responsibility on the developing countries to do something in their own countries and in meeting those goals. Whereas only one goal, goal eight, talks about global partnership. So this concern came out very clearly um, in, in the commitment of the developing countries. And that concern still remains, that we have eight seven out of the eight goals asking developing countries to meet their poverty reduction targets, to meet their maternal uh, mortality rates brought down, uh, reducing HIV AIDS rates, all these things. Whereas in one goal we talk about global partnership. That also not very forcefully. In 2002 when I uh, was appointed by Kofi Annan when he was the Secretary General as the person responsible for championing the cause of the poorest and the most vulnerable countries of the world. And there are, there were, now two less, there were 90 such countries out of 192 members of the United Nations. These are the, the least developed countries, 48 of them now. When I joined, it was 50. And then we have 31 landlocked developing countries, the countries which do not have a seashore. So to export their products by boat, outside by ship, to other markets, they have to go to third countries or second countries. And that, naturally raises the cost of their products. And then there were 38 small island developing states. These are um, 
otherwise touristic resources, idyllic places, but very vulnerable to nature, to climate change, to environmental degradation. So these are the countries. This post of mine was created for the first time in the United Nations. It was felt that these countries have nobody to speak up for them. These countries were the, what I used to call my, in my advocacy, the voiceless countries of the United Nations. They do not have economic power, military power, political power, or strategic importance. So these countries were neglected by everybody. And so this office was created to speak up for them. And when I took over in March 2002, in April, Secretary General Kofi Annan was launching the Millennium Development Goals. These goals were contained in the Millennium Summit outcome document, the Millennium Declaration, in, held in 2000. But it was not till 2002 that these were identified as eight separate goals to be pursued by the United Nations system. And that is when I found that though the Millennium Declaration have references to these three vulnerable groups of countries, least developed small island and landlocked countries, there was no mention in the Millennium Goals of these countries. So it was just by coincidence that I learned about it because I, I was only two weeks old in my office. So I wrote immediately to the Secretary General's office mentioning that we are missing an important target for this Millennium Goals. And then Secretary General and his team um, were uh, very forthcoming to recognize that these countries need special mention. So that is why they got reflected as targets in the goal number eight. As, uh, as Matt was reading out, it mentioned about these three groups of countries as special target in, in the context of the development goals, uh, meeting uh, the Millennium Development Goal. So that is the, in, in terms of global partnership also. So the partnership is important. If we speak about the problems of the developing world, we have to talk in the context of partnership because they don't have the capacity, the resources, the knowledge, the know-how, or in the context of the global economic situation, the ability to pursue those goals effectively. So, uh, uh, the, the goal number one, which you had discussed in earlier meetings, is the reduction of poverty. And reduction of poverty remains a, a, a big challenge, the rather the most important challenge for, for the, the world. And nearly 15 years ago, the General Assembly of the United Nations declared that eradicating poverty is an ethical, social, political, and economic imperative of humankind. Following the end of the first decade for eradication of poverty, which was from 97, 1997 to 2006, the General Assembly proclaimed second decade for eradication of poverty, which is now ongoing 2008 to 2017. But by 2015, we will be coming to the end of the period for Millennium uh, Development Goals achievement. And we will see whether we were able to achieve the, the halving of poverty in the developing world. Uh, as of now, I think it doesn't look like that we will be meeting that goal by 2015. So it's a big challenge, and we'll continue to, be a, to remain a challenge. Though 
big sort of progress has been made in India and China in terms of poverty reduction, maybe more in China. If we average the results achieved for India and China may be a good average for the whole world, but that will keep out a, a large number of countries who would not be able to meet these goals. So this statistical trickery of averaging will not be a good thing to do. I believe, I believe and I hope the United Nations will not go, go that way and claim success in meeting the Millennium Goal number one. The first decade has generated great awareness about the nature of poverty and greater acknowledgement of the intrinsic link between eradication of poverty and achievement of global peace and security. And this is a key point that we have to remember. And uh, uh, Dr. Randall mentioned about the, the secu security scenario. The security scenario will not be possible without meeting the development scenario because that has close link. Poverty eradication will reduce the security concerns in a big way. So we have to remember that. And during the, the first decade uh, uh, proclaimed by the UN, that link was very well established that we need to look into that. Let me mention that the, the reiteration of the global partnership for poverty reduction was expressed, and as I mentioned, during the UN Millennium Summit in 2000 and the subsequent two five-yearly UN Convened Summit. So there was a mid-decade 2005 summit, and then finally last September, there was the 2010 summit uh, to assess the progress in the Millennium Development Goals. And these conferences, as I mentioned, uh, focused on the needs of the world's most vulnerable countries. And uh, it is felt that the international solidarity, international partnership is needed to, to fight for these countries. But despite, as I mentioned, all the, despite all these commitments at the highest levels, poverty eradication continues to be the challenge of our time. It is a shame that more than a billion people out of world's almost seven billion people are languishing in extreme poverty and widespread hunger and are witnessing serious environmental degradation and demographic challenges when we have reached the heights of material progress. And percentage in terms of graphic demonstration was made by Dr. Randall in his presentation about this disparity. Can we truly be proud of that progress when such misery and deprivation pervade our world. As we know, poverty has many different faces and affects particularly women and children in the most dramatic way. Poverty constitutes a barrier to human progress and feminization of poverty makes that even worse. The definition of poverty has evolved over time the invaluable work of Nobel Prize winning economist, Professor Amartya Sen, a fellow Bengali, I am proud to say, has contributed to a crucial paradigm shift by focusing international attention on a different multidimensional concept of poverty and development. From measuring development in terms of GDP or GNI, now I, as we call it, per capita, and poverty in terms of mere income deprivation to a characterization of human development in terms of expansion of valuable 
human capabilities with a great emphasis on individual freedoms and rights. So just from calculating income to measured poverty, Professor Sen has moved to a broader dimension which where freedom and rights, human rights, play a very important role. Professor Sen sees development as freedom. Hunger and poverty deprive human beings of their dignity and self-esteem, leaving them hopeless and incapable of achieving the kind of life they value and they de desire. Against this view, freedom from hunger is not a rhetorical cry. Poor economic opportunities as well as systemic social exclusion and deprivation all constitute major sources of what we can call, and he has said it, his term, unfreedom. This multidimensional concept of poverty and development goes beyond the meaning of poverty as merely inadequate income. It goes beyond human development to show that poverty is also vulnerability and lack of voice, power, and representation. And I say it is worse to have a poverty or opportunity than poverty of a low income. So the opportunity comes out very prominent in the context of human poverty. Many of the poorest people do not have the opportunity to express themselves, to em empower themselves, to make their life the way they want to. It is now widely accepted that eradication of poverty and global peace and stability are two sides of the same coin. In today's world, these continue to be huge and persistent problems which require, as never before, the international community to stand united in a collective response. To fight poverty in, all, in this all-embracing perspective is to ensure human security. And I would like you to, to take this term into heart, human security. We are talking, these days, we are talking mainly of state security and military security. We are not talking about human security, how each one of us, human being, can feel secure in terms of my health, in terms of my education, in terms of my neighborhood, in terms of my individual security, how I can feel secure as a human being. So human security is the foundation and basis of all security considerations that we have. Previously, world's the, the globe used to have countries fighting with each other and deciding on security. Even now this is going on. But what happens to a country may be militarily very powerful, but its people can be totally insecure because they do not have the freedom, they do not have the rights, as we see in the Middle East these days. So think about that condition. Are we really, as an individual, secure? though my country may be the richest country in the world or militarily the most powerful country in the world. So that is the essence of human security and that we need to ensure that we have, each one of us has the military, uh, has the, the human security. A human rights approach to poverty reduction is now being increasingly recognized and gradually implemented internationally. Such an approach links poverty reduction to obligation rather than as pity or charity and requires policymakers to identify the most vulnerable people to come out of poverty and destitution. As has been said often, the poor are seldom poor by choice. Nobody is poor by choice. 
Very few people in this world enjoy living on handouts. Most poor people know that they are quite capable of earning their living by their own efforts and are eager to do so. But they must have, must be given a fair chance to participate. And that, that is, uh, that inequality of participation remains worldwide. The powerful has the, the, the access to participate, not the powerless. Nothing could be more depriving than denial of a fair opportunity. It is the right of every human being to be given a reasonable opportunity, a fair chance to come out of poverty. It is the poverty not of earnings, but of opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, that is most crushing. Just think of how the millions of illiterate rural women in abject poverty and discriminated by their societies in my country, Bangladesh, and 60 other countries of the world have brought their families out of poverty and found human dignity through the window of opportunity opened for them only by a small micro credit. A simple loan of $10, $15 in my country has been able to bring millions of families out of poverty. So we need to provide them this opportunity. Countries that face the most compounded challenges of human security and human development, they all suffer from extreme vulnerabilities that greatly hamper their efforts to achieve sustainable development. The nature of these vulnerabilities range from extreme poverty in the cases of the least developed countries, susceptible to environmental hazards in case of the small island countries, to physical remoteness from global markets in case of both the landlocked countries and the small island countries. When the group of the least developed countries was created by the General Assembly in, of the UN, in 1971, there were only 25 of them. Since then, the number of LDCs doubled. As I said, when I took over in 2002, this office in the UN, there were 50 of them. Now, two of them have graduated out, Cape Verde in Africa and Maldives in Asia. While globally, the average annual rate of population growth has decreased. That growth rate for least developed countries remained high at 2.4%. And Dr. Randall's chart also showed that. The combined population of least developed countries of these 48 countries is expected to nearly triple between 2000 and 2050, rising from 650 million to 1.8 billion. So can you imagine have all the support and assistance still they will hide because the additional population in their, their countries, yeah, uh, any number of schools you increase, hospitals you increase, health clinics you increase, the growing population will be always proving that to be inadequate for you. So that is a major challenge. These countries are least able to provide for their growing population, which in turn threaten sustainable development and produce further deterioration in standards of living and quality of life. The combination of extreme poverty, population pressures, and environmental degradation is a powerful destabilization factor in ways more than one. In 2008, as the world leaders were coming for their annual gathering at the United Nations, the New York Times, in its editorial, Failing the World's Poor, that was the title, lamented the disappointing performance of the international community in helping the world's poorest nations. It goes on to say, and I quote, 
whatever gains have been made against the most abject poverty, they risk being undone by the rising price of food. And this rise continues even now. The same focus is equally fitting now as the world leaders converge for the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, uh, that was the last year. The LDCs, the least developed countries, continue to be the voiceless, voiceless, marginalized, and most vulnerable countries of the world since the category was established. These countries do not attract world attention unless they are engulfed in conflict or devastated by natural disasters, such as evidenced in the recent years in the, in the cases of Maldives for tsunami and Haiti for earthquake. The recent worldwide rise in food and fuel prices compounded by the ongoing financial crisis have accentuated that vulnerability seriously jeopardizing the domestic programs that aim at reducing poverty. Nearly all of the LDCs are considered by the UN to be food deficit and 20 of them to be in food crisis. Malnourishment is pervasive and increasing, threatening to undercut recent gains in LDC health and education. This has prompted the UN to identify 26 least developed countries to be subject to political instability. So that is, that is the connection was, I was trying to make about the economic difficulties and the political security. Another example of that shock that is generated largely outside of the LDCs but affects them perhaps the most severely is climate change. Together, the LDCs emit less than one half of 1% of global greenhouse gas. But they are paying a very high portion of the human price. The most populous LDC, again, my country, Bangladesh, the low-lying Bangladesh is threatened by inundation due to rising sea levels, as are half a dozen Pacific and Indian Ocean small island countries. The majority of the least developed countries are located in sub-Saharan Africa, and their recent vibrant economic pickup is threatened by the prospect of global warming, drought, and desertification. So it is another kind of problem they face out of climate change. To gain some credibility, the United Nations and its Secretary General should be at the helm, steering the international community's efforts to get these countries out of the morass made worse by, in his own terms, the global development crisis. Secretary General had announced early in his office to focus on alleviating the plight of the bottom billion. If that catchy description has to be meaningful, then the 880 million now, 50% of whom barely survive on less than a dollar a day, living in LDCs should get the wholehearted and priority support of the United Nations system. His leadership for LDCs should be visible in all dimension of the organization's work. And the most important challenge for the LDCs is coming uh, week after next. On the 9th of May, the fourth global conference for these countries is commencing in Istanbul, Turkey, to see what can be done for these countries. And the prospects of a good outcome there seems very remote. What is missing most noticeably from this picture is a mechanism to cushion the external shocks of the terrible double Cs, as I call them. C is the letter C. One is climate change, number two is credit crunch, and number three is commodity costs. 
in many cases compounded by unplanned man-made and natural disasters like earthquakes and tsunamis. National efforts by the LDCs need to receive adequate, reliable, and continuing support by international cooperation. That is the essence of uh, MDG 8, and that is what we need to ensure. A better future for all mankind is the responsibility of all. It is in the best interest of us all. As long as billions of people have little hope of a better life, our world has no hope for being stable, secure, and peaceful. A world that can afford almost a trillion dollar, now it is $1.6 trillion a year of military expenses, must afford to mobilize the resources needed to help the developing world fight poverty, inequality, and injustice. We must resolve to eradicate poverty because the cause of development is the cause of peace. Let me bring in my concluding thoughts by recollecting what I had said standing in front of the meditation room of the United Nations as I received in May last year a petition signed by more than 50,000 people from 168 countries appealing to the world bodies to declare an annual Global Oneness Day, recognizing humanity's inner unity. There I said, and I quote myself, I believe that unless we have that sense of solidarity among the peoples of the world, all our efforts for development and peace and security will go nowhere. I added that oneness brings about an appreciation of humanity's interdependence, which supports tolerance, understanding, and solidarity as necessary steps towards peace. And this is a very essential concept we have to remember, that we are one as a humanity, and we have to stand in support of each other as part of a global community. Thank you very much.